Right. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here today, and I am so glad to be part of the COA. I even wear my lapel pin to uh, support the team. I'm Bob Slater. I'm a clinical professor at UC Davis in private practice in Folsom, California. My email is shown here, and I always welcome thoughts, comments, feedback. Happy to chat afterwards. In addition to that, I was a history major in college, so I always start with the history lesson for today. Abraham Colley, 1773 to 1843. He was a professor of anatomy, surgery, and physiology, and he was the president of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland twice. And during his presidential address one year, he talked about this fracture, the distal radius fracture. This fracture takes place, he said, about an inch and a half above the carpal extremity, the radius. This was 1814, about 81 years before x-rays were discovered and the first rentgenogram was made. And according to Professor Colley's Treatment ought to focus on manipulation, making a moderate extension until the surgeon observes the limb restored to its natural form, followed by maintenance uh, with using a thick and firm compress applied on the anterior surface of the limb and a very narrow wooden splint along the naked side of the ulna. And the latter splint, I now think, should be used in every instance. And the outcome, Professor Kali said, was the limb will at some remote period again enjoy perfect freedom in its motions and be completely exempt from pain. The deformity, however, will remain undiminished throughout life. And the key here is he didn't say full motion, just said motion in every plane. And so the question for us today is now, really? In an era when we can now land a rover the size of an SUV on planet Mars? Is that really the best we can do for radius fractures? And if we can do better, then what are the pearls and pitfalls of doing so? The radius fracture is relevant. The distal radius fracture is in fact, among the most common orthopedic fractures in the Western world. There are over 600,000 ER visits per year just in this country alone, with or without the pandemic, and 1.6 fractures per thousand people. The distribution of distal radius fractures in the general population is generally immodal, either young men in high energy trauma or older and usually female patients who sustain lower energy usually falls often with underlying osteopenia and osteoporosis. Again, history matters. It's important to take the history from our patients because that often tips us off under the pearls section here, tips us off to likely associated injuries. There could be radial head injury and elbow injury as shown here on the film or TFC injury in the wrist and nerve injuries, especially immediate nerve problems as Neil talked about today. And in the history section, the pitfalls to avoid are failing to have the pain management discussion before any treatment is instituted. We've touched on, and I'll touch on again, the opioid epidemic. It's important to have that discussion before surgery so that the patients are appropriately counseled and ready for what's coming. And then as a pitfall, figure out whether surgery is even indicated and if that's the best option. History matters. Sometimes, if we take a good history, you find out an unusual fracture mechanism, which may tip us off to associated injuries. This is a case of an open distal radius fracture inflicted by a bear mauling. This was reported in JBJS, and it happened in Jacksonville, Florida. But that's why in California, we hate bears. Cal sucks. Stanford rocks. You can put that in your speaker evaluation. There might be some bias on behalf of the speaker. I'll move on. Pre-app points under the pearls section. We've taken the history and now we need to figure out what imaging is needed. And I will attest that plain films are absolutely essential, but fluoroscopy is really enormously helpful. And I do this in the office. It may not be needed for reduction evaluation in the emergency room as reported by Daly and Stern a few years ago, JHS. And advanced imaging is rarely useful acutely. It's expensive and we're going to fix Humpty Dumpty based on intra-op findings to the best of our ability while there anyway, not based on shadows seen on images preoperatively. It's also important to avoid the pitfalls of failing to recognize the patient's baseline anatomy. So sometimes it's useful to get a contralateral wrist film, especially when evaluating scapulonate alignment, for example. And as Mark Henry pointed out in this JHS article, not long ago, failing to consider the associated injuries so common with distal radius fractures, scaphalunate, interosseous ligament, lunotriquetral, interosseous ligament, triangular fiber cartilage disc, median nerve compression, as Neil talked about, and the distal radial ulnar joint. 
once we've taken the history and evaluated the patient, we have to next figure out the best fixation method. So this was interesting to me, the JVJS that just came out last month was uh, of interest because it compared external fixation versus plate fixation. Now, in my mind, uh, external fixation is rarely used now. Usually that's reserved for polytrauma patients or those with extensive open wounds. And among the plate fixation <clears throat> champions, there are a plethora of vendors and options available. The key here is to pick one and get good at using it. But since this was in the most recent JBJS, I thought it was interesting to go through these, which was a multi-center randomized control trial of fractures, 75 treated with volar locking plate and 81 with external fixation, 40 surgeons in Norway, thus a homogeneous population. There were clear differences in reported outcomes of patients described at six weeks and three months, no significant differences at 12 months, but I submit that those first three months do matter. So my personal choice for fixation is plate fixation. And I just picked out a couple of recent examples from my own patients. This is a 28 year old woman, one year post-op. Uh, this volar spike here as seen on the lateral view will likely be a problem for the flexor tendons in the median nerve. And so fracture fixation with plate fixation through a volar approach is very helpful. It's important intraoperatively also to get the x-ray beam gantry angled the right way so that one can make sure that there is subchondral support here as illustrated and on the lateral view that the elbow is flexed, flexed slightly so that one is really looking right down the barrel of the radiocarpal joint to assure that that is a congruent surface. A couple of other different examples, a 79 year old woman with more osteoporosis with a good outcome and restoration of anatomy using a volar plate. And I also like it because it allows, and this is a 64 year old woman, three months post-op allows restoration and realignment in the radial ulnar deviation plane when that happens, as you see here with plate fixation allows restoration of that. But certainly there are alternative fixation choices the spanning bridge plate has been studied and reported in a few JHS articles not long ago. And the spanning bridge plate across the whole radius is usually used in the polytrauma situation more often than not. Another alternative fixation choice is limited hardware. So in the middle of the slide here, we see the very common fracture patterns of the distal radius. And sometimes a single cannulated screw can be used to buttress the linear facet of the distal radius, for example, or the radial styloid with a single cannulated screw, for example. And sometimes the combination of hardware is a good alternative fixation choice. Now, some years ago, there was a more of a debate uh, in our world of hand surgery about the necessity for fragment-specific fixation. And <clears throat> in fact, uh, Leanne Benson and Peter Sternall reported uh, looking at this, is it needed to have fragment-specific fixation? The answer was, the results were equivocal to standard fixation. So we don't necessarily need to do that, but sometimes combinations are very useful as shown in a couple of examples here, wires and screws supplementing more complicated injuries. And for example, the radial pin plate might be used. So sometimes plate fixation with additional screws and wire constructs are useful. Another alternative fixation choice are intramedullary nails. Now this, is a, this has been studied in a few instances. Uh, this was a randomized comparison of volar locking plates with IM nails. And in addition, a similar study, dorsal IM nailing versus plating. Uh, this was a, uh, a uh, Cochrane analysis and found that in fact, the volar locking plate performed better. This was reported in orthopedic trauma. And sometimes arthroscopic assistance is useful. So a few pictures, interest operative image of the fracture and the shaver being prepared and reduced here in the middle picture and fixed with a cannulated screw. So the intra-op pearls. Now, a few points I wanted to make here were first about the soft tissue handling. It's important to avoid bone stripping and further damage to the vessels, particularly the radial artery and tendons. So primum non nocere. And consider the intra-op management of the median nerve. Is a carpal tunnel release needed? We heard today from Neil about this. And fragment-specific fixation, that requires more incisions and more hardware that may not be needed versus just good enough for fixing the fracture. And another intra-op pearl to consider is the use of bone graft or bone graft uh, substitute 
Sometimes it's helpful to consent the patients in advance just in case if you're thinking about that, but there'll be a lot more on uh, different COA sessions on this specific topic during our annual meeting. Interop pitfalls I wanted to highlight were first the distal radial ulnar joint. It is important to check its stability and stabilize as needed, including when we're tipped off about the large ulnar styloid base fracture, which is widely displaced, may be a hint that the DRUJ is unstable. And also, as Chris D pointed out in his guest editorial in JVJS last month, what's new in hand and wrist surgery, he pointed out the potential problem of injuring the extensor tendons if one is placing hardware from the volar aspect and drives all the way through the dorsal rim. So watch out and avoid that. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about post-op pearls as well. So first, in terms of pain management. Here, it's important to hearken back to that pre-op discussion and the coaching we had with our patients about the importance of managing their pain and being aware, we surgeons, being aware of the opioid epidemic. So we talked to them before surgery. It's important to talk to them immediately after and subsequently about how to manage their pain, hopefully without narcotics. The other post-op pearl to mention is early mobilization does matter. And in some cases, judicious use of hand therapy can be very useful. Now, in the post-op arena, the main pearls here I would talk about are the fact that the U.S. Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, in his address to the AMA House of Delegates just two and a half years ago, pointed out, that there is one opioid overdose death every 12 and a half minutes in the United States. So we're trying to avoid adding to this problem as we're talking about managing the pain that comes with distal radius fractures. It's also important to keep this pendulum concept in mind. I think back 1996 was the year that OxyContin was first formulated and available. And we were told, we surgeons were told, we have to control all of our patients' pain. There ought to be zero pain. And that was uh, HCAP score, the hospitals being evaluated on that. And look how far the pendulum has swung now, 2021. We, now we surgeons are responsible for all the drug deaths that are happening and how far the pendulum is likely to swing back remains to be seen. But this fifth vital sign campaign was such a devastating problem for many of us. I would like to point out a few points really though about the supervised occupational therapy and hand therapy because in my mind this is often a, an open and unsolved question so I spent some time studying this and I would point out a few of the following points for our audience. First is that early mobilization is certainly beneficial. The Cochrane analysis that Handel and all did showed that there were better short-term improvements in pinch, grip, and range of motion. Valdez and that group reported initially that those patients that received early range of motion needed significantly fewer therapy visits overall, and in fact attained functional range of motion of wrist and forearm significantly faster. And the same group reported that supervised occupational therapy may be beneficial for those patients that we see that have the stiff diabetic hand, the stiff fingers, and other comorbidities. Now, others have argued that while early mobilization may be beneficial, maybe it's just as good if the patients do that as a home exercise program. So two randomized control trials found the patients with a home exercise program, instead of formal supervised therapy, had significantly greater improvement in their functional outcomes at six weeks, as well as at three months and six months. I contend that there may well be confounding effects. Now, it's clear that there are benefits in some studies to early supervised occupational therapy. Watt et al. reported on this and said that patients with this fracture did better with supervised therapy. K et al. reported on this and as well said the specific training their patients got, they did better uh, over a randomized trial than those that just did a home exercise program. So with this in mind, Jennifer Walji reported with her group about the variabilities in who is referred to a therapist. So she reported that patient predictors of therapy included those patients that were younger, female, had higher socioeconomic status, and fewer comorbidity 
condition. So in fact, those are the patients that have the financial wherewithal to get to a therapist and the ability to do so and are younger and healthier. So they're getting referred to therapy. She pointed out, Jen Walji pointed out that only 20% of patients receive either physical or occupational therapy following distal radius fractures. And also that the distal radius fracture therapy protocols can vary widely from massage, soft tissue treatment, manual therapy, hot and cold modalities, e-stim, ultrasound, whirlpool, and other modalities. Post-op management also has to focus on the management of the distal radial ulnar joint. The patient referred to me with a large ulnar styloid fragment. The lateral MRI shows dorsal subluxation of the distal ulna relative to the radius. We all know that ulna is actually the stable strut and the radius subluxates relative to that, but that's the common terminology, the dorsal subluxation of the ulna. And sometimes managing that winds up with the ultimate end game, which is a salvage procedure. So that is the salve capange procedure as shown here. It's important to distinguish between ulnar impaction, the ulnar head crashing into the carpus versus ulnar impingement, the distal ulna post-resection crashing into the distal radius. And a few post-op pearls and pitfalls to be aware of, managing bent and broken hardware. I found this was quite interesting, actually. It's a case report in JBJS, but they had a patient, they did ORAF, patient went out, smashed his wrist again and bent the hardware they put in. So they took the patient back to the operating room and just bent it back again. Curious. Tendon ruptures. Overall after ORIF. And in addition, post-op pitfalls to be aware of if the hardware is taken out, Remember that may leave a stress riser post-removal as shown by the screw hole marks here in an MRI in a patient that had been referred to me. And keep in mind the caveats that Chris D put in his JBJS, what's new in hand surgery last month, those problems with flexor and extensor tendon ruptures. And finally, keep in mind complex regional pain syndrome. And I think if we have time, Amy Ladd is gonna talk a bit about that. So in summary, the distal radius fracture can be considered in several ways. And some key points are first to diagnose it and evaluate for the associated injuries. At least have considered them so that you're ready to address them intraoperatively as needed. Stabilizing the fracture. If the fracture warrants surgery, be sure to achieve stability to allow that early motion as we've talked about, and then rehabilitate. Initiate early range of motion and rehab to avoid problems and maximize outcomes. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I have to say, uh, well, first of all, all hail fellow historians. <laughs> but I, I do want to comment, if this were a live session, there may be some bear maulings and someone may end up in a Folsom prison. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be happy to take care of them in Folsom here. <laughs> so Dr. Schroeder, you have a question for Dr. Slater. Yeah, my, my question was just, um, did you have any changes in your protocol with distal radius hand therapy during COVID? And if so, you know, how did that affect you and did it affect your patient's outcomes? So during the pandemic, I was shut down completely for fractures for eight weeks, as I think most surgery centers and hospitals were. That was a big problem because then we were often getting uh, fractures uh, into surgery late, and then they often actually needed more therapy. Uh, but I did not have a problem referring uh, um, to a therapist in those cases that needed it. So I, again, I think this is a little bit of an open question, who actually needs the therapy? And I think we all have a gestalt feeling about that. That's the art of it, is figuring out who's going to have more stiffness and need more guidance. Um, and I think luckily, we're beyond that pandemic issue in terms of access. How about you? Any problems? You know, I, I think um, in, in the city, no. We, we also, we had some of our therapists that were opening up video visits. So I think that that was a great transition for them. And I think that that changed some of the um, protocol and which I think will be great for future. Um, but we did, you know, in the outlying referrals, there was a lot of inability to get patients in for hand therapy, even after like flexor tendon surgeries during the pandemic, which I think was very difficult and has certainly affected some outcomes. 
Dr. Harness, you had a question. You're on mute. Yes, yeah, so some of the recent studies have shown that uh, elderly patients do okay uh, with non-operative management despite deformity. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on how you approach that. Uh, who is elderly? Um, who's not? <laughs> Anybody older than you. <laughs> <laughs> right, getting older all the time. So I think that's the point that colleagues made in 1814. Just leave them alone, they'll all do swell. Uh, and I would take issue with that. And I usually am hard pressed to say there's a chronologic cutoff for that. It's a physiologic cutoff, mm -hmm. assessing the patient, figuring out who's around to help them at home. Are they uh, dependent on using assistive walking devices and so forth? So the, the answer is there's no uh, hard and fast rule. And I'm often um, encouraging even those patients older than me to have surgery. Uh, so that they can get back to the things they love to do sooner. Thanks. So, Bob, you know, most of the distal radius fractures treated operatively are general orthopedic surgeons or trauma surgeons. And hand surgeons tend to get the complex ones or depending on their referral practice. So when should someone who treats a lot of distal radius fractures, when should they refer to a hand surgeon? Do you, what would you like to see? Would you like to see complex intraarticular, uh, ulnar fragments? Um, what's your thoughts? I think the best way that we can help our colleagues who are so good at managing these generally is to take those ones that are more difficult to fix. That is the accommodated intraarticular fracture. Those that have associated soft tissue injuries, whether it be tendon or nerve or vascular, because they are so good, our colleagues are so good at managing the majority of fractures that we can reserve our skill set for those that are more complicated. And I think uh, a lot of times that's appropriately temporary stabilizing is okay. Uh, but the dorsal bridging plate, I personally have seen more problems from that, thinking that it's going to be a temporary fix. And then it's some delay before they come in to see me and that's revised and so forth. So in that case, just leaving it splinted if they're uncertain, I think would be a better advice in that scenario. How about you, Amy? Um, well, I was just going to say you got your get out of jail card there. Um, so, no, I agree with you. Uh, the vast majority can be treated by most everybody, and it's probably the 10 percent that uh, end up being really challenging. And the the ones that are three weeks old, the intraarticular fractures, the ones that you know you're going to struggle, uh, would love to see those sooner rather than later. Agreed. Okay. 